I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, the one nation, under God, I would like to now introduce our board of directors. Uh, tonight we're joined by Jonathan H Henderson, Madeline de Maitinan, uh, Mike Rowley. I am Tasha Woods. Jason Woods is joining participating uh, with us tonight via Zoom. We are also joined by Superintendent Haberer, Executive Director of Student Services, Kelly Crownbauer, Executive Director of Finance and Operations, Kim Snyder. Our student rep representatives are not here tonight. Board, our first uh, action item is the consent agenda. We did have the opportunity to review this uh, before uh, this week. Do we have any clarifications? And if not, I will entertain a motion. I move that we, I move that we approve the consent agenda. I second. Jonathan has moved and Mike has seconded. Is there any discussion? I would like to note uh, that we do have some resignations and some retirements. Uh, and part of those resignations is, uh, I'm trying to read everyone's writing. I'm just going to, part of the retire, uh, resignations are Marlene Hughes, uh, Mackenzie Bailey, Jordan Madigan, and Liz Wilhelm. Uh, Wilhelm sorry. Uh, we want to wish them the best of luck onto what they're moving to. It's always difficult uh, when people go on for whatever reason and leave our district. We also have a retirement um, from Andrew and we are looking forward on June 1st uh, as we always do to celebrate people in person and not at a board meeting. Uh, so thank you for those uh, valued employees for planting seeds and helping our students. I'm trying, I'm trying. I've got all sorts of things in front of me. Uh, Marie Graham is retiring from the transportation department. She has worked for ESD since 1992. Sue Foy, uh, special program secretary is retiring after 21 years uh, with ESD. Uh, that's incredible. So board with that, I will uh, take a vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? <laughs> so the consent agenda is accepted. Next is superintendent update. Well, board, we have some special guests with here us with special guests with us here tonight. Um, we have uh, wonderful students and teachers here from uh, Lincoln Elementary. Uh, let's have you guys come on up first to talk to us about, as you know, we started a partnership with Pacific Education Institute and they've done a lot of great PD uh, and both Amy Holdeman and um, Shelby, I know that, Shelby Corbett. Uh, they are both on the leadership team with Pacific Education Institute. And we just really appreciate you guys and the time that you've put into that professional development and the wonderful things that you're doing with our students. So uh, they have a, wonder, a great uh, project that they did on food waste that they would like to share with us. Mike, this one. 
and field STEM coordinator. And like I said, we have worked with her previously um, with different science opportunities. So we were really excited to team with her for this food waste PEI. Um, sorry, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, after our training that we did in the winter, we just decided to give it a try. We learned that we could even implement this this current school year. And we thought, you know, this is new. This is exciting. Why not give it a try with the time that we have left for this school year? Um, so I'll just share with you guys a little bit about the unit. Um, so one of the first things that we discussed with our students was the connection to Native American traditions. And students learned through some Native American storytelling and some videos that were recommended from PEI um, that food is a gift, only take what you need. So we really learned about um, how Native Americans view food. And then um, phenomena investigations are really important and a big part of the next gen science standards. And so we did a phenomena investigation. And basically that means that we went and watched something happen and then made a scientific hypothesis and decided how we could investigate this. Um, we went and watched, my class watched first graders, is that what you're, yep. So we went and watched first graders eat in the cafeteria. And I said, we're not watching for behavior, just watch and see what do you notice about their plates? What do you notice is going on? And it was very obvious to our fifth graders that a lot of food was being wasted. And so the next steps were figuring out as our classes, like, well, how can we, how can we look into this? How can we make some data? How can we investigate? And so we made a plan to do a food waste inventory. And we'll be talking about that more in our next slides. Um, and then after the food waste inventory was done, we went back to our classrooms and learned about how this connects to the environment. And so students learned about how food waste actually contributes to additional CO2 in the atmosphere and how that's harmful to our environment. Next slide. So it's time now for us to share what our class did as themselves as fifth graders. So uh, the day before, a couple days before, and then during the food inventory observation, um, we went ahead and we had our classes uh, co-create with us basically a T-chart of our food value for most, uh, most Americans, you might say, uh, compared to native food value. And it was very apparent that uh, there were some differences. So native food value, they really see it as a food as a gift. Um, it's something to be shared. It's something that you work for. Um, really, you use it wisely compared to as many of us do feel that food is just something you eat. It's yummy. Uh, it's, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's for survival, basically. Um, you just get it at the grocery store. And we were really comparing those, those values. Uh, so the day of our fifth grade food waste inventory, our classes actually were taking inventory on their own lunch. So uh, here we are in the cafeteria, uh, just getting regular hot lunch. Next slide. Uh, we were doing inventory on both the, the school food and uh, lunch from home. Next slide. And so the way that we had this set up is that we had five gallon buckets and each bucket was labeled with a different type of food, which was also a great lesson on learning about, okay, what is fruit? What are vegetables? Um, and so as they finished up their lunches, they had to separate all of their food waste into the proper category. We were there assisting them, but they actually did a really great job on their own too. Um, and so we collected that all during lunch. And then after lunch, we went into our courtyard um, which was awesome. We love any time we get to get out there. Um, and we set up the experiment. So that's all of the students from our class. They each had their own job that they were supposed to be doing during the experiment. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so one of the jobs, we had an awesome student volunteer to be our weigher, and it ended up being a great math lesson because we found out, oh, the buckets aren't actually heavy enough to weigh on their own. So um, we learned about, okay, well, let's find the difference, subtraction. Um, and so basically a student would bring them the bucket. They would share, okay, right now we're weighing fruit. They would yell out, this is how much it weighs. 
And then after it was weighed, we would spread it all out on a piece of paper. And it was a really good visual for students to see like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we wasted all that. So go ahead and go to the next slide, thank you. So we continued with uh, weighing the food items and spreading them out. It, it was such a great opportunity. It was very hands-on. It was very captivating. Uh, here in the slide where kids are actually spreading out the food, they do have gloves on. <laughs> we definitely made sure that you know they were safe, of course. But it was such a great opportunity for them to not just walk by a trash can and, and realize that food has been being thrown away, but for them to actually see spread out in front of them everything that was wasted. Um, next slide, thank you. Continuing, um, we can see students gathering around different observations that they're making. And then final slide. So after we did our food uh, waste inventory, we came back to our classes and we needed to talk about what are we going to do based on this experiment. Um, students are excited still to share some of the things that they've learned with other people. Um, couple different opportunities that they had. I know that my class did make uh, basically a, a brainstorming list. How are we going to reduce our carbon footprint and food waste? So kids were coming up with ideas, um, take shorter showers, turning off lights, riding bicycles to go places instead of using gas powered vehicles, composting, solar energy. Um, and then I know in Mrs. Corbett's class, uh, kids had an opportunity to make some posters basically that could then be on display. They could share it with other students, other people, um, different ways that once again, um, you could reduce the carbon footprint and food waste. So yeah, and we're super excited. Actually next month, we are taking our fifth graders to the central farm and the farm is gonna tell us all about their, um, how they grow the food and make their own food and about composting. Yeah. So we're super excited. Yeah, so we kind of like to call the Central Washington University Farm one of our community partners having to do with the PEI food waste experiment because I don't know, it just really all ties in nicely. And I think it will be yeah. really interesting. And I think the kids will get a lot out of it. So yes. thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Do you guys have any questions? Amy and Shelby, I just want to thank you so much for coming tonight and sharing. I know Madeline and I were at uh, visiting schools and you guys came out and were excited to share it and we got excited about it and uh, thought, oh, I need to have them come and, and share it with the whole board. So we just appreciate you so much and your willingness to learn new things and to try that hands-on approach and now that partnership with the community. So um, board, do you have any questions for, for these guys? Since it was so successful, are you going to do it again next year? Oh, yes. absolutely. Yes. <laughs> we already have new ideas because, you know, the first one is like a trial run and it's like, OK, next year, let's do this, this, this and this. So we're excited. And that was something definite. You know, when we learned that, hey, we could actually implement this this current school year, we thought, you know, things have been so different anyway. We started at the old Lincoln building. We moved to Ida. You know, things are changing. Why not just give this a try this yeah. this year while we're nice feeling brave. <laughs> yeah. One just, more closer. Oh, no, you no. What food were, was wasted the most? Was it vegetables? It was actually fruit for this one, and which was surprising, but they actually reflected on it. And they were like, well, I think it's the strawberries because a lot of kids were like, well, we take one bite and then we throw the rest of it away. So we thought it would be vegetables. That was our hypothesis, but it was fruit. I am fortunate enough to have Ms. Holdeman as my fifth graders uh, teacher. So sorry, I said to throw that out there. This was um, such an amazing example of cross-curricular. Uh, you're probably not going to like it when I say it, but you're not gonna, probably not going to be surprised that when I pick him up and I say, oh, what did you do today? And he's like, nothing. And then I go, well, I bet you did some math. And he's like, yeah. And I go, well, what did you do? Nothing, right? Can't do, can't get anything out of him. But this was so impactful and he was so empowered and curious that all he did was observe the phenomena of dinner and tell us all of how we were wasting and what we could do and how we could go and weigh it on the scale and what we should be doing. Like he was very empowered and it definitely left uh, the classroom walls and it was really, really exciting to see. So awesome. thank you. Good, thank you guys. Thank you. Joanne, is there anything you'd like to share from a principal's perspective? 
<laughs> you know she does. I guess, um, first of all, just you could see how amazing these teachers are just to be willing to go ahead and dive in and try this. But I, I just think it's exciting. And just what um, Tasha shared, like for kids, they are more engaged and we can provide these kind of hands on opportunities. And we just want to continue to do more of that and um, continue our learning and building with the Pacific Education Institute, and Megan Rivard, and build our community partners to provide more of these kind of opportunities for our students. So, and thank you again to Shelby and Amy for being here tonight. And, and we look forward to those. We look forward to having students next time be here to, to yeah. present their findings. So thank you. And I just want to, I see Megan Rivard here with us on Zoom. And just thank you, Megan, for all of your support and your PD and uh, your inspiration uh, with our teachers and our principals. Uh, just really appreciate you and our partnership with Pacific Education Institute and your being our, our coach. You are amazing. <laughs> just do it in the heart. And I want to apologize to Jason. Jason, I should be checking in with you more. Did you want to say anything? Okay, you're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so another uh, great opportunity to hear from our schools is at Mount Stewart. Uh, and last time I was out at Mount Stewart, uh, several teachers were sharing with me just the exciting uh, work that's being done in their outdoor nature center. And so I see Michelle Beeman is here with us. And I know uh, she's been working with Scott Robertson and other teachers there to really revitalize that outdoor area, nature area. And uh, so, Michelle, take it away. Were you able to unmute her? Yep, Michelle, we're getting, to get you unmuted. Hi, there I am. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Beeman, and I am a third grade teacher at Mount Stewart. I'm here tonight to share with you some of the amazing ways myself and all of my colleagues have been utilizing the nature study area to really enhance our students' learning experiences. For those of you who aren't aware, the nature study area is a nature preserved, and it is located on Mount Stewart property. It was donated to the community in the 1970s. And this unique area really allows for some exciting opportunities to increase student engagement and take learning outside the traditional classroom settings and really provide an excellent learning environment. And just as an example for my own class, I am having the students create a garden. It's been a really amazing experience for me and them. Um, messy at times, but this activity has allowed us to really let the students take ownership of their learning and provides me the opportunity to capture a broad range of standards. And one example of this is calculating the area and perimeter of the students' garden, which aligns with the measurement and data domain of our third grade math priority standards. I also take the opportunity to incorporate some of our science standards like climate and plant growth and development into these hands-on lessons. Our students truly enjoy these project-based learning activities and really engage with the material on a much more fundamental level. Engagement and cross-modal learning like this is highly corresponded and correlated with improved student outcomes. So this type of learning is occurring across all of the grades at Mount Stewart. So I'd like to share with you a couple of other ways our teams are using this space. So our fourth grade team actually invited a biologist from the community and he took the students on a tour of the nature area and he taught them about groundwater and other concepts. In STEAM, our STEAM teacher took the kindergartners outside and they were looking and finding and categorizing things like living versus non-living things. And some of our WIN instructors have actually been taking the kids out and to the nature center and identifying different plants and animals from their reading materials, which has been amazing. And even artistic pursuits are being accomplished. Our second graders painted some rocks and they beautified the nature area. And even our Dean of Students is, has used the space for literary activities like story time. I know my daughter came home after he did that and that's all she talked about for like 
a week. It's kind of annoying, <laughs> but really cool too. Uh, Mount Stewart has a character word of the month. April's word was service. And this space also being used to help our students meet those non-academic goals. For instance, our fourth graders have taken the initiative to make the nature study more accessible. And they were raking the nature paths, they were all pruning the trees, and they were really getting involved in this. And they painted the benches in our learning area. And it's just so exciting to see the progress and the students are really, really enjoying it. And all of these are just a few ways in which we are capitalizing on, on this unique space. And we really, really do love having the nature study. My window looks out the nature study and it's, I think it's amazing when I see classes go out there and it's just really cool. So thank you guys for your time. Or do you have any questions or comments? Uh, to all the Mount Stewart teachers uh, and Michelle for showing up tonight and sharing with us all of the many ways that you're supporting students and 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 nature centered learning and community partnership. Thank you. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Jason, did you have something? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Ginger, I need to get back on my school visit too. So we'll go check that out the next time. <laughs> All right, so I will uh, just make my way through the superintendent update. Uh, here is uh, here are some pictures of the uh, of the nature center. You can see students uh, painting the benches. Already seen some great spots to read a book uh, and just to kind of get away and and have some uh, private time together with friends. Uh, but what a great, you know, if you look at these pictures here, what a great community project for our students. Uh, and I love, Michelle, how you said that your daughter just, or your child was just so excited about the story that was read just uh, by reading it outside, right? What a difference that makes. And I know uh, Mr. Lorenz was telling me that too, that the kids just love going out there to have story time with them in the nature center as a, a part of a reward. So what a great, just really appreciate you guys at Mount Stewart taking advantage of that and, and just making that a, a, an even better space that all of our students will be able to enjoy. And uh, just a few pictures too from the, um, that uh, were also shown at Lincoln. Again, thank you for um, all the learning opportunities that we're giving students uh, through that project-based learning. And as you pointed out, Tasha, that cross-curricular really will stick with kids for a long time. So we also know it's National Nurses Week and we wanna celebrate them. Uh, and uh, we know that especially throughout the pandemic, their expertise and compassion and action was very important uh, to support staff, to support our parents, to support our families. And uh, really we, we put a, a lot of uh, resource and just a thankfulness towards them and their service because it really supports our whole child approach that we take here in ESD. So again, with deep gratitude, we say thank you to Wendy, Janelle, Sally, Jessica, and Jenny, and also our health assistants, uh, Isela, Diane, uh, Lindsay, and Sarah. So thank you uh, again to our amazing nurses and health assistants for all that they do for us. So I just wanted to give you an overview of the last uh, few weeks of what some of my areas of focus have been. Certainly uh, opening of Lincoln, finishing Ida and Mount Stewart, going to many of those meetings and uh, helping to lead those efforts. We also, we talked about this in our last session, but ongoing partnerships with the city so that we can uh, move forward and get permanent occupancy of Ida uh, as well as get Lincoln open. Uh, I am on the city of Ellensburg Art 
arts leadership team, and I've put in quite a few hours with them uh, to see how can we support the arts uh, here in Ellensburg. And it's been a great opportunity to connect with uh, a different group of folks here in town that I haven't had a chance to uh, build relationship with. So um, I will keep you posted on uh, some of the developments that come out of that. Uh, I've also spent time strengthening our partnerships with CWU. I met with uh, our new uh, president, Jim Wolpart, recently, uh, and uh, will attend. He is going to be officially named as the president with a celebration next week. I'll attend that. And also working with... Um, some folks there at CWU around how could they help support us with the results from the Hanover Inclusion Equity Survey and help us uh, support us with some of those focus groups. So we'll have a partnership with them. And I think that um, uh, Ms. Dr. Wolpart really has a vision for uh, making CWU a real strong educational uh, university, which it already is, but really building on those strengths. And so I'm sure we'll have ongoing uh, communication and uh, meetings around how can we continue to partner even stronger uh, with their education department and you know, helping the student teachers that come to us here really be aware of our board ends and what the outcomes are that we want for our students and what some of those important instructional strategies are that we would like for, you know, we want to support all teachers with. Uh, we are in the process, and I'm thankful for Leslie and, and her experience in other districts with uh, communication plans. We're kind of putting a draft of that together. We recently uh, purchased Parent Square. Uh, we heard from our parents that there are multiple platforms that are being used, and we want to pull it all together and have one main way of communicating with our families, and you guys have given me that feedback as well. So we're excited to uh, be able to launch Parent Square at the beginning of next year, and we're learning how to use it now so that we can do that. And Leslie did uh, has done a great job. We've worked together uh, to um, have her go out to our media outlets and really have some guidelines uh, with media again, just so we can streamline that communication. And I look forward to uh, spending more time on that next year and really fully developing that. Uh, we have had ongoing professional development with Solution Tree. I've been participating in those professional developments along with principals. Uh, we were fortunate to have some teachers join us uh, for the last session, uh, which was around grading and reporting, uh, and had some great feedback from teachers uh, at Morgan Middle School. And we want to uh, really be intentional about inviting teachers to be a part of that uh, solution tree uh, professional development next year because next year we'll be working on creating um, formative assessments or ways to be able to uh, really see if students are um, understanding uh, the standards that are being covered and the material that's being covered in class and really internalizing that. And so we look forward to um, including teachers in on that even more next year. Uh, and as I said, we've been to have been to several several sessions on reporting and grading, knowing that uh, Tasha, I know you've shared several times from the State Board of Education is moving more towards competency based grading. And we've done a, uh, our focus this year has been on identifying essential standards and our teachers have done an amazing job with that. I had a chance to observe uh, all of the PLCs that Morgan were in one room together and I had a chance to visit with different teachers there and what I took away from those conversations is that process has helped uh, everyone just continue to know uh, the standards at a deeper level and their content at a deeper level. Um, and so we look forward to continuing that work. Uh, as you know, we are in uh, negotiations with Ellensburg Education Association, EEA. And I had the wonderful opportunity to be part of uh, Morgan Middle School's 5K fundraiser, their first one. I asked Michelle uh, how much did they raise, and she's still looking into it. So they must still be counting, <laughs> counting their uh, money from that. I did want to share... Uh, 
I wanted to share this uh, framework with you. Uh, I think it's a really good high level view of the work of professional learning communities and what the board and superintendent, what we work together on in support of professional learning communities, uh, what district level and principal teams do, how the school level teams work, and then all the way down to the actual grade level and classroom. And this is the framework that we've been working through. Um, uh, this first year was made it was really a focus on leadership and then next year really um, incorporating teachers and in more into that process. But if you have any questions about professional learning communities, this is a good framework to refer back to and we'll keep bringing back uh, more information about our work together on that. Uh, as you know, a lot of uh, my time has really been spent to uh, supporting all the different processes that need to be in place to move uh, from three to four schools. Um, our uh, movement of elementary, and we had some middle school teachers uh, at, go ahead and, and move into the disperse among the four, amongst the four schools. Uh, and those positions for the most part have been placed. We still have some open positions because we've had some people retire and resign uh, since then. And now we're currently looking at uh, placement of classified staff. So that's kind of where we're at with staffing. Uh, there has been some recent um, questions around transportation, so I just wanted to address that. Some of the questions, and I, Joanne reached out to me today, uh, some questions some of her parents had were around um, the gap between the tier of secondary transportation and elementary. And so if you hear community members asking about that, the gap is, should really be defined as what is the last bell that happens at the secondary level, which will be uh, the high school, and the first bell at the elementary level. That's really that definition of the gap. And this year, the gap was about 55 minutes, and they really worked hard to try to keep it as close to that again uh, for next year. Uh, and the gap, the reason why we have a space of, of time in between when the secondary, the last bell of the uh, secondary school and the first bell of the elementary is because um, we serve students in a 544 square mile uh, distance. And, uh, and with the current number of bus drivers that we have and the distance that we have to drive, um, we have to have a tiered system. Uh, and the tiered transportation systems, especially necessary, as you know, nationwide, statewide, there's a bus driver shortage, and we're still experiencing that here. Uh, and we would need about nine more drivers to serve all of our schools next year in a system without tiers. So that explains why we need tiers. That explains why there is that, that space in there. Um, an advantage of our attendance zones, however, is that it really eliminates that transfer station. We've talked about that before, because right now we have elementary students who have to take two different buses to get home, and the attendance zone eliminates that. So uh, that means an average time spent on the bus by elementary students will be less for next year compared to what they need to do this year. Any questions about that, that transportation piece? Because I asked Cindy, too, to be on, on with us around that. Madeline. Ginger, does that mean that the, uh, so um, there's going to be no transfers next year as far as um, secondary or uh, elementary? Cindy, would you verify that? I think that that is true. There's no transfer station. Yep, she's got the, OK, <laughs> yeah, good, good clarification. Good. Any other questions? So the child care um, right at school, uh, we have shared this in um, Blackboard. We have it as a pop-up on our website. We have posted it on Facebook. Um, I was part of, uh, the other thing that I'm a part of that uh, is the KCHN uh, network, the health network here in town, and I'm on their board. And we talked about that today, and they're getting it out to all 700 of their health employees, this information. But basically, uh, I was in touch with Right at School all the way through, and we were, had our attendance zone committees, and I said, are you sure you can add do the before and after school care? 
next year. And every time they said, yes, that shouldn't be a problem. And then recently toward the end of April, we got a letter and uh, information saying that um, they would have to stop those services for next year uh, because they just weren't bringing in the revenue that they needed to be able to keep the programs growing. Uh, that really took us by surprise. Julie, uh, our early learning coordinator, it took her by surprise as well. So we contacted them right away and we were able to work out a deal with them that if we can get 150 students to enroll in their program for next year, uh, by the end of June, that they would still um, consider being able to do it at all four schools. The clarification I wanna make is that if parents register their child at one school and then they find out, let's say they put in for a transfer request and they find out that they get the transfer request because we won't be able to tell parents about that until August, um, that non-refundable um, fee will transfer. So right now they have to sign up at a specific school, but if they end up going to a different school, that um, non-refundable fee will transfer. And I think Jonathan, you had shared that with me. Did I state that correctly? Yeah, what exactly. Because some was. people who are on the transfer list mm -hmm. are waiting to see which school before they would put in a non-refundable deposit, so. Yeah. So whatever you guys can do to help us keep getting the word out would be great. And I'm working with the health network too to see if there's ways they can help us reach out. So, oh, yeah. Sorry. Do we know how close we are to that 150 number? Uh, I wanna say we're at maybe 50 right now. So we're still a ways away, unfortunately. So our parents are amazing, we know that, and the parent groups at all four schools uh, got together and uh, contacted principals and said, you know, we are really together, uh, the district, we are together, all of us uh, own the, um, being able to give our students a real good experience in school. So they decided that let's organize uh, an open house at all four schools on the same night, which happens to be a board member, a board meeting night. So we'll actually be here at Ida and maybe we can plan it so we have a little break so we have a chance to go out and at least uh, visit with uh, parents here. Uh, so that's really exciting, and uh, I'm so appreciative of our parents, and it's just a time to welcome our new families, and uh, if a student is going to a school different than the one they're going to this year, it just gives them that opportunity to walk around and meet the staff and meet the principal, and uh, so super excited about that and just really appreciate all the time and effort that went into uh, organizing this event. I just wanted to show you, we did put this on Facebook um, and this was the right at school uh, message. Uh, so we've been communicating in as many ways as, as we know how to do. Uh, we put this on Facebook, but uh, Bo Snow, our high school principal was just recently uh, won the honorary award uh, for his all the time and effort that he puts into athletics. And I really personally say a shout out to Bo for this. It's very, uh, being a high school principal is already uh, takes a lot of time uh, and the amount of time that he puts in at athletic events is truly commendable. Uh, and I know that his support is, is really part of the overall success that we have. We have a strong athletic program and I know he works very closely together with Cole too. So a thank you to Bo and all of his time. Um, this was a good sign that we're kind of back to normal again. We finally were able to have a career fair recently, uh, and we had uh, several people, as you can see, uh, attending that, and that was just really exciting, and we were able to put this on Facebook, too, and shout out to Leslie. She's been doing a great job getting events up on Facebook, and we've had a lot of good traffic on Facebook as a result of those posts. Uh, and we just really appreciate the high school bringing the community together and giving our students an opportunity, which really fits with our board end of um, preparing our students uh, to be successful citizens when they graduate and have a better idea of maybe what kind of career, or what kind of training they might want to pursue after graduation. And uh, 
this, uh, we do have ex excellence in Ellensburg. It's that Wednesday, June 1st. So board members, if you could please put that on your calendar. Uh, this is really a fun time. Uh, we have many teachers and administrators and counselors and teams, and we have one uh, a community member who's actually getting an award that comes from uh, the superintendent uh, association that I belong to. Uh, and so it's just a wonderful time to really acknowledge we have amazing uh, staff members here in Ellensburg. And it's just a very, it's a fun time to be able to honor and celebrate all the good things that happen here every day uh, because of our staff. And then I'll just end uh, the lot there again, the Morgan Middle School Fun Run. It was great to be out there uh, with uh, families and students. And uh, I know the students kind of kept me going when I felt like stopping. <laughs> so appreciate that. And, and Mike McCloskey was at the, um, he was on the mic just encouraging all of us in that last stretch when um, I know I kind of felt like saying, oh, I'm done. He's like, no, keep going. I'm like, all right. So a thank you to Morgan and the parents, again, the parents uh, are the ones that really wanted to do this. So we just have, I think, an amazing partnership in our district with our parents and uh, them seeing themselves as part of our school. And that's my report. Board, any questions? Oh, just because Kevin's here, I'll do a shout out to uh, Kevin too, because he was out there and kind of gave me a good fist bump here and there to keep me going on, on the course as well. It was reported that Jeff Hashimoto beat all of you by a lot. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for that update. Uh, board, we're moving on to administration uh, agenda item B, parent community input session for instructional materials adoption. I don't know who has that one. Will we be getting a report from someone or is this one for us to review? Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Um, thank you for having me here board tonight to just make this announcement. Ginger wanted me to just get on and um, announce here that we are having a community input session on Monday from six to seven at the Morgan Middle School Library, um, where we will present the materials that we are proposing for adoption this year and um, kind of just give a brief presentation on all of those but have the materials available for anyone who wants to take a look at them and then also um, gather feedback. And then we're gonna take that feedback and make it electronic and make it um, public for what that feedback was. So of course, it'll go to the Instructional Materials Committee um, who reviews the materials before it goes to the school board, which is slated to be um, at the meeting on the 25th. Board, any questions? Uh, thank you for hosting that community input session and for then taking it to the instructional um, committee and bringing it to us at the end of the month. You bet. Or that takes us to business. Uh, we only have one agenda item under business state that is the board operating principles. Yes, and this was put on there because uh, the board you'd wanted me to go ahead and number the operating principles, which I did. and. Um, we just wanted, I think, to look at them one more time. I have a paper copy here, and I think at the last meeting, we just wanted to look at them one more time and see if there were any other adjustments that we wanted to make. And then um, I think uh, what you guys had agreed on was to then just sign this document, and then we can keep it um, on file with the board. Jason, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Jason. Okay, perfect. Um, my understanding too is we will update our website and put these on there as long as the board all agrees that these are our board operating principles. Um, and the only thing that I think that we might want to confirm, I think it was, um, sorry, I lost my spot. Um, it is number nine. I think we just had one slight edit 
I think it, it would read, we would just delete um, the appearance of improprietary. Um, so anyway, it would, it would read, I will avoid any conflict of interest, which could result from my position as a board member. I think that that addressed the concern that we that was addressed in the a previous meeting. So I think that that was all of it. I just thought this is one more time for final discussion in public, um, just to kind of decide: our, is this our board operating principles moving forward, especially with um, fairly new board members? I think it looks great, and you mentioned the part on number nine had brought up. So I I think it looks great. Board, any other comments? And Ginger and Leslie, you heard that edit on number nine. Um, and so board with that edit that is, uh, can be signed after uh, tonight's meeting when we're signing all of our other paperwork. Could, could, you, you, could you mention the edit one more time? I'm sorry. I will avoid any conflict of interest. And then de deletion of, or the appearance of impropriety. Okay, that's it, which could result, got it. Yep, Jonathan's agreeing. Jason, yep, okay. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, board, we'll move forward with those operating principles. Those are uh, principles that we review uh, annually and it'll be nice to have that website updated. Tonight, we do not have anything under policy. I'm checking in. So that puts us at board reports. Uh, our students are not here tonight. Um, for the teaching and learning report, it is very short. Uh, we were able to meet on April 21st with the Student Centered Learning Committee. Uh, that agenda and those items, I think, will be posted on the website or we'll, we'll put it into a, another agenda for you to look at. Um, the next meeting is, without my calendar in front of me, May 19th. And Madeline is going to be uh, joining that committee. So there will be two of us. Uh, Jason, do you have a board report tonight? I think I've, I'm going to, no, I do not. We'll wait till next meeting when I'm there. <laughs> okay, so that uh, we are done with board reports. Um, new business, proposed items for future consideration. I am not seeing any. I'm looking at you, Jason. All right, that moves us into public comment. Leslie, are we ready to move into public comment? Can I read while you're walking? Yes. All right. Uh, public comment guidelines. Individuals wishing to be heard by the board will first be recognized by the chair or president. Individuals, after identifying themselves and their address, will proceed to make comments within the three minute time limit. The chair or president may interrupt or terminate an individual statement when it's too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. As a, sorry, my God. As the board as a whole has a final decision in determining the appropriateness of all such rulings, as a general rule, board members do not respond to public comment during the meeting. Uh, the people who are joining us in Zoom, I believe that there is a document in there that you can sign up for public comment. Uh, keeping with our general protocol, we will be limiting uh, public comment to one hour. So we'll say 7.54. It's been a long time since I've run a meeting. So did I get the public comment part right? <laughs> okay, Jason's like, so Leslie, we're ready for public comment. I am Catherine Brunner. I live at 203 South Maple Street. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Catherine Brunner, and I have a son who attends Lincoln Elementary. We adore the staff and are so thankful he's able to finish his elementary school career here and despite the new attendance zones. But this year was really a struggle for me as a single mother who's supposed to work 8 to 430. While still at Lincoln in September and October, I listened to Zoom meetings from my car while in the drop-off line and walked into work every day late. 
It was a relief when students moved to Ida and when I was able to put them on the bus at 737. I'm now able to get to work on time and attend all the meetings I'm required to be at. Fast forward to last month's new newsletter with a start times for next school year. Lincoln's new school schedule will be even later, 9 to 3.30, with Wednesday's early dismissal at 2. This is very distressing. We live in, within walking distance, so now I'm facing the need for before school care and after school care because my schedule can't accommodate for a, an even later start time. While I have a good job and I don't qualify for assistance in childcare, that doesn't mean that I have the extra funds to pay for additional childcare, child especially with inflation the way it's going. Pandemic changes have been hard on students, family, families, communities, and yes, school districts as well. I don't envy some of the decisions for which your staff have had to answer for and enforce. But I'd really like to know how the schedule came to be and who made the decision, because I'm not the only parent concerned with the schedule and working parents are alike. Many parents who have fairly typical work days are going to struggle with the schedule while likely leaving children home alone before and or after school. While that might have been acceptable when we were children, that's not how the world works now. I sent a similar letter to Ginger staff last, mo last month. But y'all need to know the schedule is going to negative to negatively impact families and businesses in Ellensburg. I implore you all to discuss different start times for the schools next year. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Dwight, 402 South Quartz Mountain Drive. Uh, so for those of you that know me, uh, I'm an Ellensburg High School science teacher. I uh, currently teach ninth grade, uh, third, third year elective science class, uh, as well as a section of chemistry this year that'll, that uh, I kind of pinch hit in chemistry when the numbers get large. Uh, but I'm also the current co-president of the Ellensburg Education Association. And one of the reasons to come and speak with you tonight is just to uh, continue to reach out and ask uh, if the board is interested in talking, the association is always interested in having open conversations, dialogue about uh, solutions when the community reaches out and talks with us or reaches out to the board and suggests, you know, keeping an open mind. I just want to continue to let you know that we have over 6,000 years of collective experience uh, among the staff that you are employing that make up over that 80% of that money that you spend. Utilize that resource. It's an amazing resource. I, I think most of us are ready to have a conversation. If, if you're willing, we just want to talk, uh, keeping those conversations going uh, both ways. And so I would just uh, remind you that there's a group of us that are interested in talking at the leadership level, and we would love to, to have any conversations you're willing to have with us uh, at any time. Love to, to just get that dialogue going about any changes and things that are occurring. Other than that, I, we have so many other celebrations tonight. What a wonderful evening to hear from Shelby and former student and, uh, and so many others. And just the celebrations, Ginger, that you made, uh, you know, the 5K that Morgan put on, uh, all the volunteers. But, and then really the career fair. I mean, talk about, you know, the community turning out in huge numbers to support that endeavor to connect young people with potential careers. I just can't praise this district enough, highly enough at times, uh, for all the positive things that we do for students in this district. So... But rely on that collective experience. Don't feel like you have to go at this alone. We can team, we can communicate, and we can collaborate. So thank you. Thank you. Lee Bates. Uh 1802 North Bluegrass Lane. <clears throat> Excuse me. I feel <laughs> I feel like I'm seeing a slow death. I played for a memorial service Friday at the Methodist Church for someone I didn't know too well. I learned recently that a uh, casual friend died, sadly. And at dinner tonight, I looked at my wife and I said, you know, we were watching the evening news and reading the paper about all the things going on around our nation and world. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I feel like we have a slow death in this school district and it really saddens me. It truly saddens me to my core. I look at you, the school board members, 
And I only know Jason White. I don't know the rest of you. I know Jason fairly casually, mostly through church. But I know Jason has a graduate degree, and I bet he used a library when he was in high school, in junior high. And I'm sure college, I know in graduate school he did for sure. I don't know about the rest of you, but I think you all have at least a college degree and probably, I know a couple of you, I think I've read it, have uh, advanced degrees. You've all used libraries, you know you have. I bet you went to your high school library fairly frequently. If you are public servants and you are public servants, you work for the school district, the children who are the most important, by the way. Not the teachers, not the superintendent, not their parents even, but the kids, they're the most important. And they need a librarian in their library at, Eaton, at Ellensburg High School. It's embarrassing to live in a town a university, a regional university, a fine university. I'm an alumnus of Central Washington State College. I would be embarrassed to say that my high school didn't have a, a certified librarian with an MLS or at least an endorsement in postgraduate studies in library science. You may have a library, but it's like going to a clinic without a doctor. If you don't have a trained librarian, you don't have a library program. And I see the children walking from the young adults, I should say, walking from Morgan Middle School who won't have a librarian next year. And it makes me sad. I want you to think about that, each of you. You all used your library, you know you did. It's shameful. Please do the right thing. Take the moral high ground. We all know there's a right and there's a wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Sally here in 903 East Spokane. Um, I'm the mother of three amazing people, miraculous people. And um, so I'm kind of a mama grizzly bear, but when I'm not being a mom, I'm actually pretty nice. When I'm mama grizzly, I kind of come off a little tough. But anyway, I think a great deal of the frustration that we're feeling as a community comes from our conflicting ideas about what really constitutes communication um, I think we're falling short of this, and I'm not alone in this thinking. Um, meeting with the group after a decision has already been made, even if you don't admit the decision has already been made, is not communication. And people can see that, and we can feel that. Um, secondly, for bus drivers, I actually looked at doing, like being a bus driver just to help out. And that schedule, you have a little bit in the morning, and a little at the end of the day, and the, the salary is just, it doesn't make up for it. You can't have a job in the middle. Um, so if you want more bus drivers, you need to pay people better to do that awful hard job. I mean, it's an important job, it is a hard job. Um, it's hard to drive with three kids in the back of the car. Um, thirdly, the teachers moving. I've talked to some teachers and you know they're switching schools and switching um, classrooms, moving from portables to inside and all of that. And they don't know when that's occurring. Um, they don't know exactly when the last day or their transfer day is going to be. And there's a lot of like cleaning and painting and prepping and everything that needs to take place before they move from one classroom into the next classroom. And they just need to know as soon as possible so that, because they have so much else going on with testing and everything else, they need to know. So I don't know who tells them when that happens, but if you can tell them to tell the teachers to make that happen. Um, and then fourth, um, every child that I have talked to about the topic of librarians is just heartbroken about it. Every child I've talked to. 
every parent I've talked to, every community member I've talked to. Um, I'm a house painter and I paint for all kinds of people, every single one of them, not a single one thinks it's a good idea. And this community has a lot of bright people. We can find a way to save money, to get you know whatever that salary is. We can find that. I know we can. Um, is it possible for our district to have a vote on this? Can the city vote on whether or not to keep the librarians? Um, and fifth, my kids would like to call for a strike of the students on this topic. So, thank you. Okay, so people that are joining via Zoom, uh, now is your time to sign up or you can raise your hand if you like, but we will hold it for, Leslie, can you put 30 seconds up there just in case somebody uh, wants the opportunity? I know 30 seconds is gonna feel like a long time. <laughs> you made it longer though, Leslie. <laughs> We can count down to 30. <laughs> Where are our fifth grade teachers with our math help? <laughs> All right, I did not see anybody raise their hand. Did anyone sign up? Then we are closing public comment. Thank you for those that did make public comment. Thank you for coming. Uh, board, that moves us to our meeting closing. Uh, board calendar, do we have any updates for board calendar? Do we have any updates for clarification and next steps? Signing uh, the oh. Actually, I have a quick question for, oh, can we just get a reiteration of like, so we have next week is, Study session, study session on the 18th. Yeah. And then the following week is another board meeting. And then the first is the excellence, excellence announcement. Okay. Yep. I'll send all that to you in a line too, just so you have it all together. Yep. Go ahead, Jason. He asked my he clarified what I was gonna ask. So we're great. All right. So signing official documents will stay and sign what Leslie puts out for us. Then that leaves us to adjournment. So I will entertain a motion. I move to adjourn. I second. All right. All those in favor, thumbs up. We are adjourned. Good night.